Ram, take over. Uh, let me see if I can, uh, but can you do the starting? You uh, uh, Because it started the recording. Okay. Started and the recording. I'm, let me see if I can get the. Can you see my PowerPoint slide, Ken? Yes, I can see your slide. Okay. Anyway, uh, welcome everyone for the Neuro Symbolic Learning Ontology Track C. Again, my name is Ram Sriram, and uh, uh, Doug and uh, Cassiopeia are uh, the coaches for this particular session. And I'm going to give you a very short introduction. Uh, to uh, this was already given uh, last month, but uh, recapitulate what we have said. Uh, like most of, uh, like if especially if you are in the medical field, you can see uh, case histories like this in uh, most uh, journals or so. So you can say that uh, you can see here there's a 55 year old male who was admitted to a particular hospital with a history of abdominal pain, distension, absolute constipation, and so on. So I don't want to go read through all this thing uh, because uh, this will also be on the website. Now, what happened is that, uh, again, in the second paragraph, you can see that there were a number of investigations on the patient, namely colonoscopy, CT scan, and so on. And these are all image processing techniques. And in spite of all these things, they didn't really figure out what the problem was. And finally, after uh, some histopathological examination of the specimen, who showed prominent and enlarged uh, lymphatic fo follicles and so on, they kindly come, came to a conclusion that this is a Crohn's disease. So why am I showing this? And the reason why I'm showing this is if you look at the reasoning process here, there's a lot of things going on in image processing. There's a lot of stuff going on in a symbolic kind of knowledge type of reasoning where there are knowledge networks and you are uh, uh, navigating this particular knowledge network. So essentially what we have then is a combination of neural networks type processing for images and other things. And also, I mean, neural networks can be used for a wide range of problems, but you know, typically they're used a lot in image processing uh, uh, things right now. Uh, but also you have all this symbolic kind of reasoning that you have to do. So, so you have now a combination of neural networks and symbolic networks. So the, each one is kind of good at uh, certain things. Like neural networks is good at uh, tacit or implicit knowledge. So, uh, and uh, symbolic networks are very good at explicit knowledge. And uh, Daniel Kahanan, I think Kahanan, are, so he got his Nobel Prize. And he is one of the guys who kind of talked about uh, uh, system one and system two in terms of our, uh, our reasoning. So neural networks are more akin to system one and uh, symbolic networks are, and knowledge networks are more akin to system two. So, but then there are also kind of disadvantages of each of the systems. Uh, like for example, in neural networks explanation is hard, explaining the reasoning is hard. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, in uh, symbolic networks and knowledge networks, generating knowledge is not very easy. So the idea is to combine these two things in somehow or other, and uh, uh, and then this can also aid in generation of ontologies uh, by neural network techniques, and also ontologies to develop better neural network models. So we are talking about the symbiosis of neural networks and ontologies here. So we have uh, three sessions uh, for this uh, track C. Uh, today's is the first session, uh, Louis Lamb uh, and uh, Pascal Hitzler, Hitzler sorry, have agreed to uh, give presentations today. And uh, you can see the uh, topics that they're gonna present. Uh, Louis, Louis is gonna talk about neural symbolic AI from Turing to deep learning. And Pascal is gonna come back and talk about neural symbolic integration and case for ontologies. So, and then we have uh, speakers on April 7th and May 5th Again, followed some really good talks uh, too. Uh, and uh, you can see the titles there, Henry Kautz and Amit Seth they are gonna talk on April 7th. Uh, Pawan Kapinabati and Spencer Briner are gonna talk on May 5th. So we'll come back to these things later on. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna stop my presentation and hand and, and this over to Luis. Thank you, Ram. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I will try to be very pedagogical, very didactic in my presentation. Let me share here my uh, presentation, introduction to neurosymbolic AI. Um, can you see it full screen? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. 
So it's a bird's eye view on the introduction to AI. And uh, you will see that uh, this field, as Iran has mentioned, is uh, an effort towards bringing together two separate schools, two separate approaches that have um, not necessarily very common uh, backgrounds and uh, communities. And uh, a bit of history, symbolism and connection is in AI has been this uh, very long traditions that they are separate. Um, Neurosymbolic AI also has made contributions towards integrating uh, several aspects of uh, cognition in computing systems. And we will give, give you have an overview uh, from the beginning of the field. And then Pascal will pick up later on and will mention more uh, recent developments. And uh, one important thing here, uh, following what Ram has said, is, is that according to Les Valiant, in one of his books, um, probably approximately correct. Les Valiant is a Turing Award winner on uh, the theory of machine learning. And he's stated that the tension between reasoning and learning has a long history reaching back at least as far as Aristotle. So we don't have enough time to delve into this uh, quote here, but you have a look at uh, how we're trying to do that in computer science and AI. So many thanks to many people who have collaborated with me, including Pascal, several people from uh, many countries, from uh, my students and everyone else who has uh, collaborated with me over here. So uh, neurosymbolic AI now is a field that has, uh, has been the subject of interest of several companies. We can see that both IBM and Microsoft have been putting forward the case for neurosymbolic AI systems. So it's a field that today is showing some promise towards applications. And uh, however, we have to remember that this is very recent until recently, uh, Gary Marcos has stated in the great AI debate in December, 2019, that um, until 2018, very few people were interested in this hybrid approach that integrate uh, learning and reasoning as he has defended in his book, Algebraic Mind, that inspired several works in um, neurosymbolic computing, neurosymbolic AI. And also uh, he mentioned our book that has several contributions that uh, show that uh, logic and learning in uh, connection and settings can be, can be done. Uh, in addition, uh, we have recently wrote a paper on the third wave of neurosymbolic AI, Arthur Garcia and myself, and uh, we, we made a, a, an overview of the field, pointing out the, the key questions that we have to answer. Um, for instance, how to identify the, 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 the necessary and sufficient building blocks of AI, how to make AI systems more trustworthy, um, what's the best representation for neurosymbolic AI, how one can build neurosymbolic AI systems that are more effective, and several challenges that we identify for the principal integration of learning and reasoning. So this paper has an overview that is way uh, more deep and has several references, including works by several people in the community that uh, where you can ex expand the, the knowledge that you gather today from uh, this talk. And uh, we'll, we will probably be formally publishing this paper um, uh, early in 2021 in a, in a, in a, in a journal. So uh, we know that AI now is very popular. Uh, it was not like that in the 90s, um, but since, the, since the, 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 the last few years, it has become very, very popular, in particular systems that integrate learning and reasoning. We have some aspects of science that have influenced technology and economics over the last two decades, including the web, the development of the web. And I'm very happy that we are in an ontology meeting over here, that people know the importance of ontologies and formal reasoning in web development and web applications. And also now we are dealing with this uh, impact that AI has over us since, for instance, this, this image that shows the uh, one of the series of games between Gary Kasparov and Deep Blue. But as pointed out in several reports made by leading societies, leading groups of researchers, we have several challenges that AI and machine learning still have to respond. And uh, one of the challenges I, put, I identify here, which is the challenge of interpretability, is uh, something very important because uh, interpretability gives semantics to, gives reasons give models to systems, to formal systems, give semantics and formalities as well as a better formalization to what's going on in terms of uh, the basis of a technology. And the AI is a field that is 
uh, heavily based in computer science and the models that computer science have developed over the years. So to build interpretable systems is something extremely important and neurosymbolic AI can contribute towards this aim. Another important issue, another important challenge is to refer to verification and validation. As Ren has said, it's hard to explain, to validate and verify neural networks for their complexity. And another challenge that we have here in a field uh, of causality also can be identified and directly to directly connected to neurosymbolic AI because finding explanations, finding the right explanations and the cause and effects, the relationships between the cause and effects of uh, machine, machine learning systems is still a very open problem as many people in this community have uh, been saying. And um, in addition to that, uh, the, another point that we have to deal with is the black box issue. How can we explain why neural learning systems achieve the results that they achieve? And um, in a way, neurosymbolic issues allow us to identify the process of how machines think, machine com machines compute. And that's why I mentioned uh, Turing in, in the title in the beginning as well, in the announcement of the proposal, because the, pre the thinking process, no matter what, how, mu how much you have um, advanced in, in cognitive science, brain science, neuroscience, and uh, several fields, including computer science, it's a still a mystery to us. And we don't know uh, all the answers to the question, the, the simple question that Turing has made. Turing was someone that worked across the fields. He, he made several contributions to symbolic AI, as everyone knows, and, but also was interested in learning theory. And uh, this question about machines thinking, it's still not answered, but we have to see how much has been done in the field of neurosymbolic AI. There is, a, a, of course, a big jump from Turing to the early 2000s. And um, we have to remind us that by the early 2000s, neural networks were not very popular, including uh, neural networks in the, in, uh, including the, the NeurIPS conference, that is, of course, the Neural Information Processing Systems Conference, where neural networks by the early 2000s were uh, not very popular. Very few people were presenting papers related to artificial neural networks and connectionist models in the traditional way we see today. And also at the AAAI conference or HKI conference, it were very hard to find papers that uh, looked at neural networks or papers that integrated learning and reasoning using neurosymbolic systems as we did uh, over the early 2000s. And Pascal was another proponent of several methods that are related and connected to our uh, work here. And we even have done uh, some joint work together, of course. And uh, by the early 2000, 2006, Jeff Hinton published a paper that was very influential in the scientific community. He showed a fast learning algorithm for deep belief, for deep belief nets. And uh, this paper has influenced a lot of research on deep neural networks. And uh, this paper at first reached only the, the connectionist community, the machine learning community, but later some groundbreaking results were published in particular uh, related to the, the ImageNet classification in the early 2010s, the ImageNet classification paper. Also, uh, there was some very influential paper by uh, Lacun, uh, Benjo and Jeff Hinton about deep learning in the Nature Journal, uh, other papers on the representation learning, uh, of course, Jürgen Schmidt-Huber, who has been the proponent of LSTMs, long short-term memories in the, in the 90s, also wrote about deep learning and the results. And then the rest in terms of uh, the impact that deep, lear that deep learning has had is now a short of history. But let's, let's see why this neurosymbolic stuff is so difficult to, to integrate communities and integrate the perspectives. In the beginning of AI, most researchers were symbolists. And I bring here the figure, the picture of Her Alan Neal and Herbert Simon. Herbert Simon is the only person who won the Turing Award win, the Turing Award and the Economic Nobel Prize as well. So he's a brilliant scientist. He proposed in the 50s the logic theories that was able to prove some theorems from Principia Mathematica by White, Whitehead and Russell. He also proposed the general problem solver that also dealt with symbolic mathematics and chess playing, and he separated knowledge from the strategy. So he was clearly a symbolist that believed even believing in, the, in, the, in AI being more related to the reasoning process. However, uh, the recent successes of um, AI are more directly connected to the connectionist, connectionist school that since the 80s has been uh, put forward the issue for neural learning algorithms via several gradient descent methods and their applications and, uh, and their architectures that they derived from them. And we even had three not three Turing Award winners in the name of Jeff Hinton, Ian Lekun, and Yosha Benjo, who have been awarded by the ACM, the Nobel Prize of Computing, given their contributions with 
uh, respect to neural network learning. We, not, we have another figure, however, that maybe is trying to bring to, to build bridges here, which is Les Valiant, another Turing Award winner. He has even a model for a bridge, a bridging model for parallel computation. So perhaps is the kind of person that defends this integrative approach, where he says that the reconciliation between two contradictory characteristics, the apparent logical nature of reasoning and the apparent statistical nature of learning is a challenge for computer science, a fundamental question in AI. And this is what we do in neurosymbolic computation, neurosymbolic AI. We try to combine the techniques brought from the school of computer science logic with the techniques brought from the machine learning and the neurocomputation community. And here I give an example, neurocomputation, neurosymbolic computation is based on learning from experience and learning and reasoning from about what has been learned from the environment. Here I use as an example, my, my daughter, when she was observing us to, to brush her teeth when she was quite young, she realized that she could learn and apply the same process and she could reason about the information she gathered from us to do the same process over her doll. So it just gives you a, a kind of a knowledge that I hope you, you will not forget how learning and reasoning are integrated processes. And uh, the motivation here is that we need to learn, of course, from changes in the environment, reason about common sense knowledge, which is still a big challenge in AI. We've had several conferences and several schools on common sense knowledge, common sense reasoning. Uh, since, the, since the 80s, we have the symposium on common sense knowledge, knowledge representation, and to integrate this kind of reasoning, be it formal reasoning or be it common sense reasoning in, and machine learning is something that is still very hard. And um, reasoning is hard, it's hard to formalize. We don't have too many people working on uh, formal reasoning, mathematical logic, and this kind of, of subjects in, uh, in science. And uh, there is a saying that even uh, during the during the during the 1930s, logic was seen as a field that was very strange. That even the topologists thought that logic was very a very strange field. So thinking and working with logic and integrating that with a complex field of neural networks, which was much more related to statistical methods, to probabilistic methods, to uncertainty, and and combining uncertainty and combining precision is something that the neurosymbolic guys has have been done since the early 90s. And one key work that has been done in the 90s was undoubtedly the work by Jeff Towell and Jude Shavlik, also the work by Stefan Hodobler and Kalinke about combining and about representing propositional uh, logic programs, prolog programs in neural networks and how one could learn this kind of problems and also could have a massive parallel systems for computing uh, logical statements for computing logic programming rules. And this gave rise to several proposals. And one of the systems that became popular in this, in the, in this time was the this, this system called C CILP by Arthur Garces and Gerson Jabrusha, who brought several ideas and brought several concepts from uh, Tao and Shavlik and Hodobler and Kalinke that allowed the integration of learning, reasoning, and knowledge extraction from recurrent networks. And technically, the CILP systems uh, use semilinear neurons to approximate the fixed point operator of prop propositional logic problems with negation. So in the end of the day, what we were able to do in the CILP system was also to prove that, was, that there, there exists some kind of neural network, if it for a neural network with recurrence here that we can see in this picture, that was able to compute uh, the fixed point semantics of a program. So in a way, we showed uh, Arthur Garces and the other uh, collaborators, and also the, based on the work by Hodober, based on the work of uh, Shavlik and Tower, was they were able to show that it was possible to compute logic programs within the framework of artificial neural networks. But in order to have richer systems so that we can, for instance, work with ontologies, that is the kind of work that Pascal will show you, we have to enrich neural, the neural ability to learn other kinds of logical systems. And uh, a big challenge over in the field of, of uh, neurosymbolic AI has been how to represent systems, logical systems that go beyond temporal, tempor beyond propositional logic, beyond propositional statements. How one can represent and learn that's even more relevant to several applications, for instance, relations, for instance, predicates between objects. And one insight that we had in the early 2000 was that we could see uh, the neural networks or the neurons 
as, uh, as a, for, for instance, a state machine, or for instance, as a possible world representation. And in this way, we developed a system called connectionist model logic that could represent in the ensembles of neural networks, the possible worlds and the relations between the possible worlds that we have in model logic. We can also relate that also to temporal evolution of systems in time. And then in a way we can represent other, other kinds of logical systems within the framework of um, connectionist systems. And here uh, it's important to, to also to mention that as proven by Moshe Vardy, model logic goes beyond propositional reasoning. So in a way we have some form of relational reasoning being formally represented in neural networks. And another point that is important here, modalities can also be used to represent uncertainty in the style of uh, Joe Halpern. And so one can also consider logics and, and, and learning with respect to probabilistic and uncertainty reasoning. And there have been several uh, communities that have been working in this field and several workshops that have been organized so that people represent their results and present the results in these workshops, in the start to seminars and several workshops organized for instance by AAAI and so on. But to give you an idea of uh, what's involved in connectionist uh, models that represent model logics and represent temporal reasoning, temporal logics, one can assume here, for instance, that neurons can be seen as an abstraction of possible worlds. And this way you can also see the neurons as abstracting possible states in a temporal evolution in, in time. And this is very relevant because both propositional model logic and uh, temporal logics over some certain operators, they are decidable fragments of first order logic with two variables. This means that we have some, probably something that is still efficient in terms of learning if we devise the proper algorithms over here. And uh, we are able to show that the systems were um, capable of uh, providing full solutions to several uh, challenges and several benchmarks for distributed knowledge representation, including uh, the, muddy children, the, the muddy children puzzle, the wise man puzzle, um, for instance, the multi hall puzzle, and several other puzzles and benchmarks that are used in distributed representation and distributed knowledge in multi agent systems as test beds to, to check and to verify if logical systems are. Uh, good for this kind of representation, but also we're, we're able to show that when we represent um, logical problems that are endowed with temporal, temporal components or endowed with modalities, for instance, uh, model logic programs, propositional model logic programs, the networks are, were also able to prove that there was a convergence to the result of the program. So in a way, um, the representation of model reasoning and temporal reasoning in artificial neural networks, uh, ne neural networks that represent the logical inference rules in a finite set, finite but potentially increasing um, number of states that we have in, in, a, in neural networks, we are able to represent and learn how to make the inferences that are represented here by the rules of model inference. For instance, uh, here we have this natural deduction style rules for reasoning over model logic, and we are able to teach the system uh, to, to make the system to learn how to proceed in terms of these logical inferences using artificial neural network systems that represented these relations and they represented, for instance, programs that this one here, this program P here, that shows, for instance, that in the world or in the, the neuron W1, we have certain clauses and then we can build this uh, relationship between possible worlds that are relationships between neurons and then we can train the network that it learns the logical problems and then it learns also how um, to make this kind of inference and integrate logical reasoning that goes beyond propositional logic, propositional logic and neural networks. And here we have, and this we'll have to, 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 to ask you to, to check the papers and the books, we have a way, for instance, a pictorial representation of how a logical program with modalities can be represented in some neural network setting. Of course, in order to do this representation of uh, representing these applications and then dealing with the operators of model logic rules and representing the relationships between possible worlds, there are algorithms where we translate this kind of um, information, this kind of logical rules to neural networks and then train the neural network so that it can achieve logical learning that goes beyond propositional logic. And here one can also think that if in, if in here we have these algorithms that translate and are used to train the neural network in a fixed setting, for instance, you translate several of the clauses in 
uh, in uh, several logical systems to via these algorithms to build a network that is then trained and reasons over uh, over modal information or temporal information. One can also think about how to build the proper embeddings that translate modal information into some kind of embedding that are used today, for instance, in logic tensor networks, so that one can reason over uh, sets of objects that are represented over real values. So there are several open problems and several over que open questions that can be uh, put forward and can be uh, dealt with. Another problem that is interesting to think about in terms of uh, temporal reasoning is that uh, we are able to represent how knowledge evolves in time. For instance, when one thinks in terms of, uh, of systems that evolve in time, in terms of temporal reasoning, it's important to have the ability to formally represent time as knowledge evolves in time, knowledge is, is refined in time, and the, mo the most to evolve in time of uh, your learning procedure, it's expected that one wants to have better and better um, answers and better and better results. And uh, also here, in order to do with uh, temporal evolution of knowledge, one has to cater for how to represent the temporal evolution in time. And in order to do so, we developed also algorithms that translate uh, the inference rules for dealing with time. Here, for instance, we have a temporal model of a very simple tem propositional temporal logic in linear time. And we're able to show that uh, it was possible to represent um, in neural networks the logical rules that correspond to the semantics of temporal reasoning. And in a way, we have a way of representing how the knowledge from an agent or the knowledge from a multi-agent system evolves in time. For instance, if we have the simple, uh, the simple representation of uh, the knowledge of uh, some agent in time, we can represent how the agent evolves its knowledge over time and represents using, for instance, here the next time operator represented in the black dot, how can we represent the evolution of uh, knowledge in time. And we, we, we can even uh, show how to represent not only the knowledge about time, but also how the knowledge of the agent evolves in time, building then a system where temporal evolution is represented via connectionist models. I know that seems uh, uh, very abstract at the moment, but we have uh, ways and we show in the papers how one represents the, the, the rules for agents, how one can translate the, the, the rules that uh, represent the test beds uh, with respect to the knowledge of the agents that evolve in time. And we can also show how to prove the, some correspondence results between the logical systems and the neural network that's built to uh, build um, in order to represent uh, the logical system that one has at hand. Several of the systems of course, have had uh, applications in, um, in several fields. Uh, but the point here is that in order to build a principled approach to neurosymbolic AI, one has to consider that one brings, when one brings knowledge from uh, logic in computer science, from computational logic, one also brings some of the results that logic uh, offers to computer science. For instance, soundness results that are brought by logical systems to uh, to this field of uh, machine learning. And in order to deal with, um, with reasoning, which, which has been uh, shown here and has been commented that uh, is, can be very hard to represent, one has to consider that there are several forms of reasoning that human agents use. And so that uh, in order to integrate knowledge representation and reasoning, one cannot only think of propositional logic or predicate logics. There are other forms of relational reasoning, uh, of full predicate reasoning, of model logics, of uh, knowledge representation mechanisms that are used, for instance, in ontology modeling that need to have appropriate mappings or appropriate embeddings from the sentences that are represented in logic systems and are then used as, um, as background knowledge or as background reasoning towards more integrative systems that combine knowledge representation and machine learning. And several workshops, several conferences, several symposia have been organized and the point about neurosymbolic systems is that we want still uh, to develop this language that describe the alternative algorithms that a network neurons and a network of neurons can be implemented, as Les Valiant said. So when we look at a knowledge at, at, um, at a neural network that is very effective, for instance, in image processing or natural language processing 
or in machine translation, other applications that uh, deep learning has been very successful. Uh, the, challenge, the challenge here is to understand, to interpret what's going on. And in order to do so, if we start from some logic specification to describe the data that we have, we have a more, uh, well, a more um, principal approach where we can explain the phenomena of intelligent behavior. So, uh, in our, and then just to finish here, because we are kind of running out of time, the same way that uh, uh, Gary Kasparov stated when uh, he played this series of games um, um, uh, against IBM Deep Blue, in, first in night six when he won, and then in 97 when he was defeated, he said that he could smell a new kind of intelligence across the table. And he said that although I think I did see some signs of intelligence, it's a weird kind, an inefficient, inflexible kind that makes me feel that I still have a few years left. Of course, Gary Kasparov has left chess. He's now has several other endeavors. But however, in order to explain what's going on in AI systems, in order to explain what's going on with respect to the results, the amazing results that deep learning has provided us, one needs to find a way to explain this new kind of intelligence that is across the table or across the screen or on the screen of our uh, mobile devices. So this is what the, one of the key aims that we have in Neurosymbolic AI. And I leave you uh, with a very long uh, list of several papers that have been very influential in the field, several papers since the 90s. Uh, some of the papers have been written, of course, by Pascal and other collaborators here. And what I wanted to, to finally uh, mention is that uh, you can have a look at some of the recent um, uh, survey papers that we have been published, some of the books that we published in the field, including uh, books by ourselves, book by Pascal Hitzler here and Barbara Hammer, who have added a collection of papers with several directions in the field. And some of these papers are uh, very relevant uh, to understand what's going on, to understand the principles of neurosymbolic AI, and to have a better grasp of how the field can develop and one can find ways uh, towards interpretable and explainable AI systems. So thank you very much. I think I run out of time here. Um, 30 minutes would not be enough to give you uh, a very good idea in terms of the technicalities or a very pedagogical view, but I want you to give some ideas that uh, logic and learning have been uh, the subject of uh, research uh, over several years, and there are some formal results and experiments that show that there is a way forward towards using neurosymbolic AI in several applications. So I thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you again, Luis, on the on an excellent uh, overview. Uh, I think you have some time constraints, but uh, you know, the, uh, maybe you can take a quick one or two questions. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure I see any questions on chat right now. Uh, let me see if uh, uh, yeah, your presentation, I guess you're going to send it to us so that I'll send you to you. Yeah. yeah. So because I you have a lot you. of references out there. Yes, uh, there are lots of references and uh, I put the reference over there because, uh, well, you know, uh, it was going to be uh, hard to, to, to make justice to the field in only uh, 30 minutes. So uh, yeah. that was the point that I tried to make so that uh, people can have access to the to the references and read the papers, right? Yeah, so, I have a quick uh, yeah. question. Uh, so you have, uh, like, if you look at the knowledge networks, but if you look at neural network and uh, knowledge networks, so the in out there's a lot, there a lot of ways these things can be combined together. One is the nodes on the uh, on the knowledge network could be uh, input nodes, could be input nodes to the uh, neural network. Similarly. For the from the uh, output nodes of neural networks can also be part of the knowledge networks, and the neural network it's, itself could be uh, one of the things which Jeff Hinton kind of says is that you know in neural networks itself you can encode the knowledge symbolic knowledge somehow or other. So there is this three ways of kind somehow combining this uh, knowledge networks and uh, neural networks. Do you have any comments on that? Yes, uh, there are several ways of encoding. You have uh, the translation algorithms. You have the the several embeddings that you can use using graph embeddings, for instance, vector embeddings for uh, in, in several ways, as is the case of LTNs, logical sensor networks that probably Pascal is gonna 
uh, mention a little bit. And uh, what I think is that uh, we still do not have the, the winning approach. It's too early to say that uh, the most effective approach is to use a translation algorithm or is to, using, is to use an embedding method based on vectors or tensors or to use some form of fuzzy reasoning to represent uh, what kind of logical system is more effective. However, I was, I was very happy that, uh, Pascal, that today uh, we, we used to say in our community, Pascal and ourselves, that people say, well, it's everything is based on vectors. And we used to say that vectors are symbols too. But today I saw a Twitter by Ilya Sutskevar from, uh, of course, from the deep learning community. And he just stated in his Twitter, vector are symbols too. Well, we've been seeing, saying that for, for 10 years. I'm very happy that deep learning also agrees with us that uh, we have symbolic uh, AI, symbolic logic and uh, symbolic computer science, Pascal has uh, some collaborations and some possible results that can be used in, in deep learning. And I'm sure that Pascal will show it in his conversation, his talk now. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Riz. And now uh, let's uh, uh, thank you again uh, uh, for, the, for the wonderful talk. Uh, Pascal, now if you can take over. And just so people, please be on mute. Thanks a lot, Ram. Um, I'm assuming you, you hear me, otherwise you'll alert me. Uh, and you should see the screen share uh, with a full screen slide at the moment. If that's not the case, then please let me know. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks thanks to Lewis uh, for the for the for the kind of bird's eyes perspective there, and of course Lewis was one of the people who um, who were kind of holding up the the topic of of neural symbolic integration during the AI winter, um, and then of course deep learning came and and uh, you know AI came back, um, and that's where we are right and uh, and one of the things that of course also happens and this is why we're having this session is that uh, for the last few years. The theme of um, neural symbolic integration and of the need for doing that also came back, right? So there's something happening there. Of course, I'm very delighted about it. And uh, kind of during the AI winter, while, while I was trying to also follow up on the topic, it was very difficult to get funding. Um, and then, of course, deep learning hit and things got in motion. And I was watching it. And when they finally managed to get chess by self training, you know, uh, beyond human level, then I said, okay, now it's time to go back to logics uh, because now we're at the level of complexity where we can start addressing some of the problems which before deep learning just were completely out of scope. So, all right. So what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to, for, well, I, I don't have to give you all the background because um, uh, Luis did all that. And I put a link to my slides uh, on the chat uh, if you want to download it for a local copy, look at the references and stuff like that. Um, so I will be focusing more specifically on neural symbolic integration and semantic web topics um, because that's that's kind of what I'm currently doing because I'm mostly a semantic webber, as you know, uh, but I'm kind of trying to tie this back in. And of course, logics play a role as well. There's an overview article which we published a year ago, which is a kind of vision position paper. Uh, have a look at that if you, if you like. So I want to talk about two themes here. Uh, and both of them are, of course, very subjective, mostly about our own work and, you know, with, with a little bit of pointers uh, to, to what others are doing. And the first one is I want to talk about deep deductive reasoners, um, at which well, mo mostly around, around uh, logics relevant for the semantic web. And in the second part, I want to talk a little bit about explainable AI using knowledge graphs. Um, so yeah, OK, let, let's just dive in. So for deep deductive reasoners, again, there is a, an article which, which essentially gives an overview of our work, which is uh, to appear in applied intelligence. Uh, you'll find that easily if you, if you search for it. Um, all right. So what we did was we trained deep learning to do deductive reasoning. Um, and, you know, one of the things was because now with deep learning, it seemed possible to do that because it was completely out of scope 15 years ago. Now, you can ask, why is this interesting? And there's a, a number of, of, uh, of reasons you can give why this is interesting. One of them would be that it may help to deal with noisy data where symbolic reasoners do very poorly. Uh, it may help for <coughs> because symbolic algorithms of some, somebody, somebody uh, uh, just, just coughed loudly. You may want to mute yourself if, uh, if you're not muted. 
if you're not talking. Also hear background noise, so please, please do that. You may do it for speed as symbolic algorithms are of very high complexity, while after training a network should be quick. You may want to study this out of principle because you want to learn about the capabilities of deep learning for complicated cognitive tasks, right? We're very, with the last point, we're very close to uh, things studied in cognitive science, for example. So it's not only us machine learning AI people actually looking at this topic, but also understanding how is it possible that our neural brains can do highly symbolic tasks. It's also a very fundamental question, of course. So, um, if we said that this is interesting from whatever perspective, um, then we can look at deductive reasoning as you do with formal logics or, and in our semantic web context over OWL or, RD, or RDF using rules, whatever. Um, and we can understand this reasoning as a classification problem. And that kind of moves us into the machine learning realm where at least we can formulate the problem as a machine learning problem. So given a set of logical formulas, a theory, right? Then any formula, any other formula expressing accessible over the same language is either a logical consequence or not a logical consequence of this theory. So now you have your classification problem, right? You give it a, a new formula and the system should tell you yes or no. And in principle, you could say, well, okay, let's use some machine learning methods to, well, let the machine learn reasoning that way. Uh, and it turns out that this is a really hard machine learning problem, even for simple logics, as we will see uh, in the following. There is another perspective you can take on that. Uh, given a set of logical formulas, what you want to do is you want to produce all logical consequences, of course, under certain constraints, because the set is in general infinite, right? So you want to put some constraints there on length, etc. But uh, essentially, you want to compute all the logical consequences. Um, and uh, uh, again, you know, you can understand this as a machine learning problem. In comes a theory, out comes a completed theory, right? So uh, this is what you want to learn. All right, so I want to talk about four things and I want to talk about four different lines we've been looking at um, uh, very briefly only uh, for interest of time, but I want to run briefly through those. Um, the, in the first two, we will focus on RDFS. Um, which if you're not from the Semendi web world, it's, it's, a, a, it's a very simple logic. I'll talk a little bit about what it is. Then we'll talk about OWL, which is a description logic, and then uh, some first order predicate logic, just very briefly, uh, logic tensor networks, which, which Louis already mentioned. So RDFS reasoning using memory networks. Memory networks is a specific approach to deep learning. So what is RDF? It's one of the simplest useful knowledge representation languages that is not propositional. Um, so essentially, think knowledge graph. Um, in a knowledge graph, you have node edge node triples, such as Barack Obama is of type president, Barack Obama, husband of Michelle Obama, etc. And then RDF has a fixed small set of inference rules, how to deductively derive additional such triples from the given triples. And most of those are centered around reasoning along subclass hierarchies. Like if X is of, ty is of type Y is in the class Y and Y is a subclass of Z, then X is also uh, of type C, so in the class C. Like for example, with the knowledge base up there, Barack Obama is president, president is subclass of human, so we can infer Barack Obama is also pre uh, human. Um, very simple logic. It's actually 13 inference rules for RDFS. Um, okay, so now one of the things here which is important is that if we want to learn to reason, so we want the system to learn to do deductive reasoning, then we want it to be able to reason over unseen knowledge graphs. So completely new topics, com completely new uh, data that comes in over, an, over a knowledge graph and the system should already be trained to reason with the new stuff. And that's actually a little bit tricky because um, in order to set deep learning up, you have to convert everything into vectors. So you have to produce embeddings and many of the embedding uh, approaches are actually based, for example, on the strings that are used, right? You do some, some word embeddings, things like this. Um, 
or on structural issues, uh, structural uh, properties of the knowledge graph itself, for example. So that means, um, well, if you use the knowledge graph itself, you know, to decide on the embeddings and the embeddings influence the deep learning system, then how can you make this transfer to completely new knowledge graphs? And the approach we took here is that we essentially do a normalization upfront. Of course, we have to fix a maximum size for the knowledge graph for the vocabulary. And then we essentially normalize everything into standard names. Essentially, we make one hot vectors uh, out of those. Um, and, uh, and use those. So essentially, if we get a new knowledge graph, then we transfer it again, transform it again, normalize it into this, this uh, representation using one hot vectors. Um, and then since the system has learned to, to deal with those, we get a transfer. All right, so memory networks. Memory networks means that in the end, the vectorized knowledge graph is stored in a memory. And whenever we ask the system, the trained system, a question, it has learned to find within this memory the pieces which help answer uh, the question. And then it feeds those again into a neural network, a trained neural network, which then out of these pieces produces the answer. Um, now, um, in order, because we have a reasoning process underlying what we're doing, which often happens in several steps, at least, you know, introspectively, uh, we set up the system in the same way that it does several reasoning hops, in that case, 10 reasoning hops. Uh, and just a high level overview of the of the architecture here at the bottom right, you have a query right which is normalized, then what happens, assuming a train system here. Um, this normalized vector is has an embedding how this embedding is is done is actually also part of the training. Um, then the attention mechanism looks at the vectorized the embedded knowledge graph and picks out the pieces which help answering the question or do the next reasoning step fits this all into uh, a trained system as well and puts out something the out output may be an answer yes or no right logical consequence or not logical consequence or it may be another query which we then feed back again second hop and third hop and so on uh, these memory networks actually come from natural language uh, studies, so do it having to do with natural language uh, based reasoning, uh, which is why, you know, it seemed reasonable to, to try use those. So um, results, that's that's too too much data to devour, but let's just look at the lower table, the top four uh, rows there. So and just the last piece, the accuracy piece. Don't worry too much about what exactly uh, we use for training and stuff like that. Um, but the, the main takeaway here is the top is um, our uh, reasoning accuracy over RDFS, where we essentially just used for evaluation any linked data we found on the web, right? So we just went out there, grabbed something, tried it. That worked pretty well, right? 96% accuracy. And I was, I was kind of looking at it and said, wow. Um, we also, and now look at the fourth row, we also made some synthetic data over which reasoning is complicated. We'll come to that in the next slide. And it turns out if we use synthetic data, which is kind of artificially difficult to deal with, um, uh, then uh, we're actually dropping this to 52%. So let, let me show you what, what goes on there. And I see there's questions coming in on the on the in the uh, in the chat. I'll try to tend to them after this part uh, and then see what we can manage there. All right, so if we look at uh, reasoning depth, you know, the symbolic reasoning depth, um, then what actually happens is that if we feed it linked data, right, which you just grab on the web and look how many reasoning hops using a symbolic reasoner do you actually need to make the completion? Then it turns out for linked data that's just out there, right? three do sometimes you need a fourth but three really do that's not very deep reasoning for our synthetic data we actually need 10 hops to do that so and that may indicate that it's 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 really much more complicated all right but anyway uh seems to work well on on reasonable uh logics the, the knowledge graph sizes we used here were a thousand triples we did not really investigate scalability yet right a thousand is far away from practical applicability right but it was more about the concept here um all right, this is what we have here. And I mean, the, the high accuracy is, is very encouraging. So let me have a brief look at the at the questions here. Um, so uh, 
could you expand on that assertion? Symbolic reasoners do very poorly on noisy data. All right. So I mean, if, if you use a deductive reasoner, so the question is, what do you mean with noise, right? Uh, I'll, I'll uh, say you take your, your uh, knowledge base uh, and whatever, any, for example, forward rule-based reasoning system, and then just say you throw in some mistakes uh, in, the, in the theory which you feed as input to the system, then these mistakes will propagate. They will do crazy stuff uh, regarding the outcome of the reasoning. And the more complicated your logic, the more crazy stuff will happen. Uh, I'll come actually to one example there because we looked at this in more detail, uh, not, in, not in the next part, but in the part after that. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, expand on the notion of normalized vocabulary. Well, essentially what we do is, is we, we, um, we use one, one hot vectors, right? We have, uh, say, you allow a, a maximum of thousand vocabulary pieces that gives you, the, the, you take a vector size, uh, a ve vectors of size 1000, right? And you use only one hot vectors. And then you just um, assign whatever URL is in your knowledge graph to one of these one hot vectors, right? It, essentially arbitrary. This, that's all the normalization we do, nothing else there. Um, I'm concerned about how you would normalize between ontologies that have different commitments to TLO constructs. Uh, no, no, we, we, we don't, don't worry about that, right? It's, you, you need to keep the internal, the inc internal, um, uh, struct the internal relations, of course. So you normalize one URI becomes one one hot vector throughout the whole knowledge base, throughout the whole no the whole knowledge graph, of course. And yeah, that that seems to work. Uh, Ravi asks, how universal is it for variations in training sets? We do not know yet, to be honest. Uh, we didn't look at that. So, but yeah, interesting question. Um, we actually used a very weird training set because we didn't think much about, we just grabbed something. It turns out, turned out afterwards that all our RDF was in fact OWL, uh, which we interpreted as RDF, which sounds weird, uh, but we trained with that and it worked really well on linked data, which in its nature is completely different. So, uh, but we haven't really looked at that in detail. All right, thanks for the questions. Yeah, um, uh, Pascal, yeah. Mike Bennett has a question there. Did you see that on the chat? Yes, I, I, I think I answered that. You, you, you answered the first sentence, which was really introducing the problem oh, okay. that you didn't answer, which is that, of course, Barack Obama is not the president. And some upper ontologies would have president as a thing in role, and other ontologies would have just what you had, Barack is a type president. Oh, How do you normalize between different sources that are out there? No, that's that's a, that's in these different ways. I understand. It's a non problem for our setting. Right, because um, the the benchmark is what we want to do is we feed a knowledge graph, we run it through a symbolic RDFS reasoner, and what we get out there is our target, right? So you know all these common sense aspects don't play a role. The the point is that you want to learn to produce whatever the symbolic reasoner would output. So. Uh, we can only do what a symbolic reasoner can do, right? And if you have the corresponding information part of your knowledge graph, then of course that's fine. But if, if it's not there, then you can't cover that. So, so from that perspective, that's not a, not a problem. I want to move on now. Thanks, I know there's more questions, but um, I have more things to cover. Um, all right, the next one is breaking results. So I got them three days ago. Uh, and so I can give you only a little bit there. One of the things we wanted to do is get away from the just query answering point, but look at generative reasoning. So we want to feed a knowledge graph and as output get the completed knowledge graph with all the other RDFS inferences part of the new knowledge graph. And um, um, one of the sad things about papers uh, in deep learning is, is that you never get the story of how many things people tried and they didn't work, right? So let me just say here, the, our first attempt, or Moni Reyes' first attempt, this is really her work last, the previous one has worked as well, was to use transformers and it did not work, right? But pointer networks actually worked. What are pointer networks? Very high level. Uh, pointer networks point to input elements, and they are used in settings where the output elements are actually the same as the input elements. So you can, instead of producing an output element, you produce a pointer to an input element as output element, right? I mean, that's exactly the setting we have in reasoning. Uh, and since you do only pointing, that also means that this naturally has a transfer ability uh, to new knowledge graphs. Um, and uh, yeah, they've, they've been used for quite a lot of kind of systems of, of this type. Um, 
what happens there, and now just to, to give you an idea what happens here is uh, you kind of, you feed things in, uh, like for example, you would feed in those two formulas. That's a mock toy example. You feed in those two form, those two statements in this sequence. And then the system, you know, would at some stage say, okay, now we're pointing to this A is the next one. And then we're pointing to this one. That's the next symbol. And then we're pointing to this here. Uh, sorry, this here, that's the next symbol and a subset sub, uh, subclass of D would be uh, the response. So this is kind of the rough idea how this works. And um, uh, we, we, of course, use different variations, just ignore the subword text. That's a different way of chunking the input. Uh, tokenizer uh, is, is what worked best. And on RDF, we're actually at 99% accuracy. Um, there is a different approach that was published in the many web journal 2019 by uh, Basim Magni and James Hendler. Uh, we used their data set um, for evaluation and theirs used a, 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 you know, a rather complicated architecture and approach. What we do is a straightforward application of pointer networks and our approach is slightly better uh, on the same data set. Um, we do not, we do not, I don't have the data yet for transfer to a completely new knowledge graph, but we're rather optimistic about that. If the, if this presentation would be next week, I'd probably have the data. Um, now I want to also um, uh, point your attention to the, the lower part of this formula, which is on, on the logic ER or Auli L, if you want to call it like that. So we have some preliminary results here as well, and they vary between 73 and 49% accuracy, which is actually not bad. And I'll come back to that in the next part of the talk. All right. <coughs> so the next part here, this is work primarily by Aaron Eberhardt, um, uh, is now about the description logic EL plus, or in other words, owl 2 el or most of it. Um, now, if you're not familiar what that is, don't worry too much about the strange no notation here if you're not familiar with description logic notation. Essentially, each uh, on the left, you see that there is after normalization, there are only six allowed uh, shapes of formulas. And all of those can be translated into first order predicate logic if you want, but they look much more complicated there. So once one gets used to this shortcut form, which is description logic notation, it actually helps a lot. Um, then reasoning over the L2EL logic or EL, EL plus or ER logic is also can also be done by completion rules. This would be the ones in the box. It's six completion rules in that case. On the left hand, the think of think of it kind of sequent calculus style, right? The left things on the left are what you need, and the things on the right is what you get. Um, and the, these are to be interpreted as shapes, as shapes of the of the axioms. So it looks like a very simple logic, only six rules, not 13, right? Um, however, in terms of the reasoning complexity, well, not the formal complexity, but the things you can do with the logic, it's much more expressive. Um, it is a, a logic that is that is uh, clearly beyond propositional. Um, it is a polynomial time logic though, and it's used a lot, for example, in biomedical ontology. So uh, it's, it's a heavily used fragment of the OWL standard. Um, in particular, you can actually do much longer reasoning chains here, uh, for example. So, all right. So what was the idea here? Well, it is again, something you can do using forward chaining rules. So, and uh, Aaron was, was following this, this train of thought and said, well, if we do that, then uh, we would usually say, well, there are intermediate results before we move on. <coughs> and these intermediate results, they can be traced back to parts of the input. So, and he called this part of the input, which is relevant for the immediate results, the support uh, for the in intermediate results. Uh, and what he then said was, well, we train the system, we take a system, and uh, we use a symbolic reasoner to produce the supports at each step. And then we just use an LSTM, um, long short term memory you may be familiar with, well, specific deep learning architecture. Uh, and then do a kind of piecewise training. We first train the LSTM cell, and this is kind of because it, it takes sequences as inputs uh, and then produces sequences as outputs. It's, it's, it's uh, in one, right? You see several of these cells. Essentially, we teach it to first produce the support, and then we take another uh, LSTM cell, which we teach it to produce the completion from the supports. And then we just stitch them together and see how it runs. So this was the idea. Um, and then, of course, just 
to, to, to find out kind of how, how well it does compared with, with a more straightforward architecture, uh, we also set one up where the support is just learned directly from the input output piece and then one where we just don't use the support. So even more straightforward, assuming that it wouldn't do as well. Um, we manually encode uh, the formulas as vectors. Um, there, there's a kind of complicated way we, we did doing that. All, all our vectors all just have four uh, uh, four dimensions and uh, yeah, some calculations which kind of make it work. Doesn't matter too much, but it's not learned, it's actually encoded. And uh, this is the outcomes. And don't, don't worry too much about the many numbers. Let me just give you the thrust of it. The thrust of it is that uh, we do better than a random guesser, right? Which I actually, you know, knowing how complicated this stuff is, uh, I think that's an achievement. But we're not really doing very well on absolute scale, right? Getting 15% getting accuracy, roughly, uh, the bold face stuff, isn't really that exciting. But well, yeah, we beat a random guesser. Okay, now compare that also uh, to the results, to the later results, which I just showed you, but which Monira Ibrahimi has produced using pointer networks, where we're at between 49 and 74 percent accuracy, right? So we kind of pushed that quite a bit uh, in, in the last year, or the last two years. All right, um, and here I want to go to noisy data. Let me just zoom into one of those because we looked at a, at a lot of different, uh, different variables. Um, what this here shows um, is the, the bottom is the random guess or ignore that. Uh, these curly lines here are represent what the deep learning system does. Okay, so uh, there's essentially the uh, how well it does on the left hand side and the horizontal um, represents probability of corruption in the knowledge base. So we artificially add noise and what we wanted to know is when does the noise cause the symbolic reasoner to perform worse than the deep learning system and the symbolic reasoner is here these uh, po point dash lines down here. So you see the, the deep learning system essentially performs pretty much the same no matter how much noise you add, but the symbolic reasoner actually declines. Now the cutoff point here is at about 50% corruption, which is of course too much to be practically useful, but you have to start somewhere, right? This is, this is the first baseline and we're looking at this data for the other systems as well, but we don't have that yet. All right. Um, Ravi says, uh, Pascal, can you randomly go to the web and create a training set for a set of keywords? Um, well, tr create a training set for our approaches. Yes, of course. I mean, this is essentially what we, what we did for the RDF part. We just grabbed stuff from the internet, used that to train, and then we grabbed other stuff from the internet and used that to evaluate. So this is what we did. For ER, it's a little bit more tricky because you don't get uh, large large enough and variety enough knowledge bases out there in Auliel. So what we used for that was a, a kind of pseudo random generator, uh, which we used for the training, but we also evaluated it, for example, in SNOMED, um, which is which is a large scale knowledge base. All right. Um, this is the fourth part now of, it, of the deep reasoner thing. I they want to do that only very briefly and then go to explainable AI. Um, this is on the deductive capability of logic tensor networks. Lewis mentioned that briefly, a lot uh, neural tens, uh, logic tensor networks go back to neural tensor networks, um, which you may be familiar with if you're a deep learning person. Um, and logic tensor networks are due to Serafini and Garces. Of course, you know Luciano Serafini if you're a semantic Weber and Arthur was also one of the people, Arthur Garces, one of the people who kept up the neural symbolic angle during the, the AI winter. Uh, and who's also been organizing the workshops uh, with us. So um, they have been used for image analysis on the background knowledge. Um, and uh, there was an Ichikai paper a few years ago. Uh, but but we at that time, we hadn't found a paper which really looked at, at the deductive reasoning ability of them. So, so we essentially ran some tests here. And this was primarily uh, uh, the work of, uh, of Federico Bianchi, who's, uh, who's now in Milan, or he actually, he was in Milan, but he was visiting our lab for, um, for half a year or so. Um, okay, so this, these logic, sorry, I wanted to, to leave this up. Um, the underlying logic here is first order predicate logic, which you interpret in kind of in a fuzzy way, because what you get is not true, hard, yes, or uh, true or false, hard true, true or false is, but you actually get uh, truth values essentially. Um, 
every language primitive becomes a vector or matrix or tensor depending on what it is, how complicated the language primitive is, whether it's a predicate or a function, etc. Uh, then terms, atoms, formulas are embedded as corresponding tensor matrix vector multiplications over the primitives. So, so the, the, uh, the, the structural production of a, of a formula becomes, gets translated into vector, into matrix multiplications. That's the key idea, right? Um, and then what you do is you learn these embeddings given, well, a given theory. And you, you learn these embeddings in such a way that the formulas in the given theory should actually produce true for all these formulas because that's your assumed ground truth. And then you, to check the, the reasoning ability, what you do is you take a new formula, right, which may or may not be a logical consequence. You run it through that system and it tells you what the system thinks about its truth, okay? Um, and uh, if, if we cannot do that, and train the system to 0.99 satisfiability over the given theory, then what we got was, for example, an F1 value uh, of 64%, which is actually not too bad. Um, so so that, that's rather nice. Um, the, the thing that has to be said, though, is that this approach has a massive scalability problem. Let me show you this. Um, here on the right, take, take the right hand uh, table. Um, on the on the vertical axis is the number of predicates, in this case of arity three. Uh, on the horizontal axis is the number of constants in the logic, right? And now if you take four predicates of arity three and 30 constants, and you know, you can't do anything knowledge representation with that, then training time is already about 800 seconds. Now, if you move it a little bit up and take 30 predicates of arity three, and, uh, and 30 constants, then your training time is already an hour, right? And, and you're, of course, far away from doing anything with that. Plus, your training actually depends on the theory. So if you take a new theory, you have to retrain, which means the system does not transfer to, uh, to new, uh, to new uh, knowledge bases. So, but still, you know, it, it's interesting to see what you can do with this approach. And perhaps, you know, some smart people come up with ideas how to do this better. All right, so um, let's move to the second part, which I want to talk about here. And that is uh, a different type of combining the symbolic and the sub-symbolic uh, world or the neural world, which is relevant for semantic web. And that is the idea of explaining deep learning via symbolic background knowledge. If you're from the AI uh, corner, you probably know uh, that explainable AI is a big topic. Uh, because um, artificial neural networks are, by their sheer nature, black boxes. They're really complicated inside and they essentially do a ton of um, real number chasing inside and you don't really know what they're doing. So, they, you know, it's very difficult to, uh, to understand what they do, to assess what they do correct, to correct them, etc. other than by statistical means. Um, and if I, if a, 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 a deep learning system declines my application for, for a credit card and the only answer I get is because your profile uh, shows us that in 70% uh, of the cases, uh, uh, people of your profile default on their credit card debt, right? That's, that's not an answer you want, right? You want to know why, what's the reason also for legal purposes, etc. So explaining and um, a lot of the work um, happening in on explainable AI um, does things like, for example, explaining the output of an AI system in terms of the input given to the AI system. You, uh, for example, if, if the input are images, then you would get highlights of the parts of the input images, which are supposedly telling you which pieces the network actually has mostly looked at and things like this. So. If I think of explaining the output in terms of the input, then I think, uh, well, no, it's not an explanation. It's the, it's the human making the connection. And it doesn't work for some things. Like, for example, um, if I want to understand why the system moved, um, uh, put a certain piece in a game of Go at a certain point, then I do not want an explanation which highlights uh, the relevant part 
of the input image. It doesn't help me much, right? That's not how a human learns. What I want is an explanation in much more abstract terms like this move prevents uh, a co-fight, right? Things like this, which is a term from the game of Go, if you're familiar with the game. So I actually want explanations which are not in terms of the input you feed to the deep learning system, but which in, are in more abstract terms or, well, in terms of background knowledge, which you give to the system, background knowledge, which is human understandable. So this is what we're looking at. Uh, and I think I just explained all this here. So how are we doing this? Explain behavior of trained deep neural networks. So idea is use background knowledge. Um, and uh, what we then do is we link the network inputs to and the outputs, if we want, to background knowledge. And then we want to use a symbolic system to generate an explanatory theory. And we've been embarking on this for quite some while already. Uh, it's tricky, but I can show you where we are right now uh, and, and why we think it, it looks promising going forward. Okay, we have key components, but it's still early stages. So this would be an idea. Uh, like you have, you, have some, um, you have some images, you assume they're annotated, um, and then you can link them to a knowledge graph or some background knowledge. Uh, you have a convolutional neural network, for example, to classify the images, and then you may get uh, things that are that are positive or negative images, or you may get images that are correctly classified and things that are incorrectly classified. You may want to understand commonalities between the pictures that are incorrectly classified. And then uh, you run that through a symbolic system. We use a concept induction system. I'll explain that in a minute uh, to get an explanation why that may be the case. So this is the, the general setup concept deduction. You may have heard about DL Learner. It was basically Jens Lehmann's work and I helped him a little bit with, with the theory behind it. Um, and uh, what it does, it, it takes symbolic input. This is an example called Michalski's trains. You take uh, two sets of what you call positive and negative examples, not, not presented as an image, but as in a symbolic encoding, like for example, uh, uh, first order predicate logic. And then the system learns an explanation, well, like a category um, or a class expression in terms of description logics, which captures all the things in the positive examples and none of the things in negative example or an approximation thereof if that's impossible. Uh, for example, in this case, uh, having a car which is both closed and short you know, completely describes the positive and none of the negatives. And this is, of course, uh, again, just a different syntax for a first order logic expression. Now, we couldn't use the DL learner for what we wanted to do because it didn't scale well enough, uh, because the reasoning uh, aspect here is, is, uh, is highly complex. So we made a heuristic algorithm uh, and cast that into a system, which we call the EC, EC system, efficient concept induction from instances was presented at AAAI 19. There was a lot of work, so that kind of delayed what we really wanted to do, but in any way, we got the system. And I don't want to talk too much about it. It uses a heuristic. It uses only class hierarchies as background knowledge, uh, although that's not a hard restriction, but currently that's what we have. It does reasonably well, uh, despite the heuristics on examples, and it can handle data sets of sizes where DL learner simply does not. All right, proof of concept experiment, which we did. This is from uh, the ADE20K data set, image classification. Um, we used as background knowledge for our first uh, feasibility study, study uh, the SUMO ontology, the suggested merger, suggested merged upper ontology. Um, I think it's not 25,000 common terms. I think it's, it's, it's fewer, but, but anyway, I have to check that. Um, but this is what we tried. Um, and then, for example, uh, because the AD20K data set already comes with annotations, um, we just could, uh, well, take these annotations, map them to Sumo, and then run DL Learner. So, for example, in this particular case, we used as positive images things like on the, on the left, there were actually warehouses from the outside, and the things on the right were warehouses from the inside. And uh, one of the things we got, for example, was something like contains a transitway, right, or contains a land area, which are all terms which are not among the input annotations, right? They're terms from the background knowledge. A more interesting example, probably here, for this proof of concept, we gave it mountain pictures uh, and other pictures on the other side. And what it came back with was, ah, contains a body of water. And then we said, what's that? We gave it mountain pictures. 
right? Uh, and then we looked at the mountain pictures and it turned out all mountain pictures in the ADE 20K data set actually contain a body of water. Uh, so, you know, talk about detecting biases in your data sets, right? For example, there's a question here. Uh, concept categories of images, how will thematic background and random image annotation only compare? No idea. So, um, right, we're, we're, we're at early stages here. We're trying to first get it to work. Um, all right, and, and then we we moved into, into uh, more explorations, also not necessarily on deep learning, but just understanding data differences. We have some projects uh, where we do that uh, in, in other contexts and found out that, that Sumo is probably just not uh, enough for us. We need something that's more expressive. Uh, and uh, what we settled on was looking at uh, Wiki, the Wikipedia class hierarchy because it has um, uh, whatever, two, two, 2 million or so concepts, um, which is just a lot and covers a, a ton of things. Um, with the problem, of course, that the Wikipedia class hierarchy is not really a hierarchy because it has cycles, because it's crowdsourced. So we had to uh, uh, find a good way of actually correcting that, which we did. I don't want to talk about these details. That was presented um, earlier this year. And um, uh, what we now have is here a, a comparison on, on similar examples. What we got out of with Sumo and with Wikipedia. So for ex this is just one of the examples. Here we had workrooms as positive examples, warehouses as negative ones on the right. Sumo tells us things like durable good and not forest product. Uh, Wikipedia tells us something like wrenches and tools and not lumber, right? Which makes much more sense to me. Um, uh, also, for example, yeah, okay, let, let's just leave it at that. Um, so, and also with other experiments we run, it just turns out that Wikipedia category hierarchy or our version thereof, our curated version thereof is, is, uh, makes, makes more sense. We could also do some, some structured evaluation here, which shows that, it <coughs> that we get better coverage scores uh, using our concept induction algorithm. All right, now this is where we are. We're just starting. Okay, so what do we want to do with this? There's two lines of research which we are currently pursuing, uh, well, three lines of research which we are currently pursuing in the lab. The first one is use this approach to identify meaning of hidden neurons. That idea is pretty much the same, but uh, it doesn't mean that it's easy. It's not at all easy because it's a huge search space. And the other line we are looking at is use the approach to improve deep learning systems by understanding on which things the deep learning system makes mistakes and then using that information to actually correct and improve the deep learning system. So there will be stuff forthcoming on this, hopefully sometime this year, uh, if things go well. Uh, it turns out that everything neural symbolic is just tough. Uh, so we'll see. And then also, we, as I mentioned, we have applications to understand data differences. So you, you, can, you can use this general approach, you know, with some modifications for whatever, ever any uh, machine learning problem uh, approach you have, not only deep learning, for example, uh, pin false positives against true positives, find out where it makes mistakes, uh, improve your, your machine learning system. So that's the key idea. Um, Tim, question by Wikipedia categories, do you mean the Wikidata types? Uh, no, not Wikidata, Wikipedia categories. So if you look at Wikipedia, actually not on, on your mobile phone, but on the web, then every Wikipedia page uh, has categories attached to them. Um, and this is the categories we, we use. Um, these categories are also within Wikipedia. Uh, uh, actually, uh, you know, there's, there's subcategory relationships uh, which, are, which have been added to those. But I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a complete mess, but it's crowdsourced, right? So they make sense in a certain way. And since we're doing all this in a, in a, a in a, uh, in a machine learning context, you know, it, it seems to work rather well for us. Um, might Wikidata types be another possibility? My answer is yes, they, they might be, right? Um, uh, yeah, I, I'd have to look into that. Uh, I do not know how much you have there, but of course, um, I mean, wh whatever we can get. Um, you talked about explainability linked to a CNN. Could the same be done to extract explanations of a GNN? Any, any, right? But this is what we need to, need to look at. Uh, what we really want to do is identify meaning of hidden neurons in whatever architecture. We probably start with CNNs because there is a, a common narrative that uh, later, later layers of a CNN represent, make a more abstract representation. 
Uh, I do not know how well substantiated that is, right? But along these lines, it makes sense to, for example, start with the last layer of a CNN and see if we can find some meaning there. Um, but I think in principle, you can also do that for others. But, you know, it's much too early to tell. Using open web sources like Wikipedia leaves you vulnerable to random background changes. Do you have to capture a copy to create a stable baseline? Yes, that's all we do. So, so we just we just grab what we had, we created that we're using that. And and you know, at the level of precision where we're or investigation, which we do, which is still very preliminary, that's completely sufficient. So we don't have to look into that. Once we get the approach to work, you know, it may be very interesting to look at what these changes do. So definitely. Is error analysis not in enough for correcting the errors. Um, well, I, I don't know, right? Um, uh, it may be, yeah, it may be, uh, but, I, but I don't know. Um, uh, I think it's, it's, it's a different perspective here. And of course it needs to be investigated whether we really add uh, on top of that, but we will only find out if we get our approach to work and then can compare it with others and see whether it does worse or better or which I kind of expect something complementary, and then you may be able to add those two. But I really don't know. I'm completely speculating. All right. Thanks for all the questions, uh, by the way. All right. Uh, very, very quick conclusions, right? Bridging the neural symbolic gap is still a major quest. Uh, and there's tons of opportunities. So we looked at we looked at the two pieces, uh, deep deductive reasoners and uh, explainable AI using background knowledge. I think both of those uh, have a ton of promise from co the conceptual side. They make a lot of sense as research endeavors. And there's a lot of work that can be done there because there's there's a, a lot of different approaches you can take uh, trying to make them work. So this is this is really exciting stuff. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of, I was waiting during the AI winter, I was waiting for, for, you know, topics like this to come back to finally be able to get some funding for this line of work, right? So I'm, I'm, this is really cool. Very happy about that. Uh, and now the last question is hidden behind my, behind my uh, Zoom navigation bar, but I can move it. Okay. Um, Pascal or Louis, what is the meaning in symbolic reasoning among scalar vector tensor matrix set usage? I don't think I understand the question. Uh, I think uh, Pascal, the thing is more to do with uh, representation there, like in neural network, you have a vector representation. Okay. So in, in, even a symbolic uh, reasoning, you can convert that into vectors kind of thing and uh, process it. And uh, so it just, it's probably looking at you know what is the what is the difference? In All right. Things. All right. So let, let let me let me try let me try to give a a very general response here. Thanks thanks a lot, Ram. Uh, so uh, I mean to be honest, I don't know if Louis is still on. Um, I don't feel comfortable contradicting him when he's not here, but I'll do it anyway. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> Louis, Louis said um, vectors are also just symbolic. I very fundamentally disagree with that statement, <laughs> right? So, but let me explain why. Um, vectors live in a continuous universe. Uh, they live in the universe of real numbers where everything is, is well continuous. Um, symbolic processing lives in a highly discontinuous world, in a discrete world. Now, uh, why does this make a difference? Well. Technically, you need the continuous world to make uh, deep learning work, right? It also has to do with, with, with gradients and all this kind of stuff, uh, if you look at it. Um, but also more systematically, what is the difference between continuous world and non-continuous world? And one of the key differences is that in a continuous world, <coughs> small input changes produce small output changes. In a, uh, in a discrete world, that is not the case. Small input changes produce sometimes massive output changes. Uh, and that is the kind of the mathematical underpinning between those two different types of worlds. Uh, and you know, this is why when, when artificial neural networks uh, manage to do, to, to, to get the game of Go to better than human, you know, I was still, well, Go still feels very much more a continuous problem to me than chess. You move one piece a little bit in the game of Go, 
it it may often not completely uh, change the the uh, the evaluation of the position. In chess, if you take one piece and move it a little bit, then I think you much more often get a massive change in evaluation of the position. So chess feels to me as a much more discontinuous uh, setting. Uh, than Go, for example, does. And backgammon is actually even much more continuous, which is why it was solved with artificial neural networks before the advent of deep learning. Kind of we go 30 years back or something like that. Uh, so from that perspective, that is why when 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 chess was done, I kind of started to pay attention uh, for for you know dealing logic, doing logical stuff with, with artificial networks. So this is the kind of fundamental difference here. Um, and of course, you know, uh, because of these recent advances, we're starting to bridge. I still don't think we really understand what that bridging means. Uh, there are mathematical ways to bridge. Uh, I've done some work of that in my dissertation and follow up, you know, during the AI winter, uh, but they didn't lead to, to practical ways of bridging. All right, uh, let's yeah. do one more question because then we're out of time, I guess. I think we're out of time. There's one other question from Rajat Sinde. Can you look at it, Pascal? Yeah, that's I think the last one, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, in deep deductive reasoners, what does the deep network try to optimize in terms of loss functional loss? Is the same as what we use for conventional deep learning networks? Um, it, it, you know, it depends on the setting and, and how you want to train it. But, but, but uh, in 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 general. Um, um, in, in general, right, I mean, you have your target, the target may be a classification or the target may be the completed knowledge base. And then, of course, you have to find a smart way of comparing them, right? And that's that's your loss. Uh, but you need to look at the different setting. I would have to look it up for the for the concrete things we did, how we set it there. Feel free to follow up by email on questions. And I'll put you through to the people who are actually working on the technical details. Um, slides, um, I, 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 if you can download the slides already, then that's fine. But perhaps, Ram, you can also grab them. Yeah. Um, and I do not know anything about quantum computers. Oh, difference among discrete and continuous. I think I, I probably talked about the systematic stuff, but the implementation stuff, we don't have time for that right now. So I guess. Okay, I think uh, we have, uh, we're almost at 1.30. Thanks a lot, Pascal, for that excellent talk. And uh, also talk provoking and people let me have add that the um, the slides are available um, there's a link on the meeting page for um, for the day session okay so i'm now turning over to ken ken i think you can bring it to a closure now so yeah thanks everyone thanks rom thanks pascal and uh, thanks to luis and all the great questions and with that we're going to um, adjourn the meeting. Yep. And then we'll uh, see you again uh, next week and the week, week after that and so on. <laughs> we have two more sessions of the neurosymbolic computing, as I mentioned before. Thanks a lot and thanks for running this.